Oh, come in, come in. Oh. Well, good to see you. Sorry it's been a while. Do come and have a seat. You'll see I've got out my my nice boxed um, three volume set of The Lord of the Rings. I so enjoyed reading that bit of The Hobbit to you the other day. I thought, let's have an episode, a brief episode. This is from the two times. Remember, I was spurred on. It was a, I think a visit before last by this lovely little book. Uh, about um, pipe smoking in the Lord of the Rings. Um, and I read you the, the opening, in fact, not the Lord of the Rings, I read you the, the thing from early in The Hobbit when Bilbo and Gandalf share a pipe. But uh, one of the episodes I love best, and I feel it may have had some impulse, uh, imp input, input or uh, impulse from Tolkien's own war experiences in the, uh, it's in the Two Towers, uh, and it's when um, they come uh, after their other victories, but all war worn and travel stained to try and make a reckoning with Saruman, only to discover, and they're also been desperately looking for Pippin and Merry, the missing hobbits, and you know there's been this heroic chase by. Uh, the three friends, um, Gimli and Legolas and Aragorn. But we know, of course, off you know, the other bits of the book, that in fact, Pippin and Merry have run into Treebeard, and Treebeard has become, it's been the sort of little stone that looses the, the whole valley, and all the trees are wakened and roused, and they themselves besiege um, Isengard. And that's, uh, I mean, it's an amazingly prophetic passage because Isengard, you know, Saruman is the mind of the metal and wheels. Isengard stands to some degree, or suggests, the kind of industrial revolution, and that he just kills the trees for the sake of them, and he burns them to, to stoke the fires of all things. And, um, of course, the trees eventually surround him, and what they do is unleash water. And, uh, I mean, all of that, in terms of our dependence on trees, in terms of uh, rising water levels, there may be more in it than we or even Tolkien realised. But there's a magnificent scene where they arrive and uh, they see this inexplicable ruination. They realise that they're on the edge of a battle that's just been. And then in a heap of rubble they see <laughs> these two tired little foot soldiers, if you were, these young hobbits, having a well-earned rest and then breaking out a pipe and smoking. And I just wonder whether part of it doesn't go back to Tolkien's own experience in the ordinary. I mean, he was an officer, of course, on the Western Front, but, you know, the privates and the others, you know, if they did finally get a break from the battle and the carnage, you know, having a crafty smoke somewhere and a little bit of uh, whatever they could loot from a barn, you know. So, uh, it's got a whole, it's, it's also a wonderful little discussion about smoking as well. So here we go. This is from the end of the chapter, The Road to Isengard. The king and all his company, this is Theoden, the king who's come finally to reckon with his neighbour Saruman. The king and all his company sat silent on their horses, marvelling, perceiving that the power of Saruman was overthrown, but how they could not guess. And now they turned their eyes towards the archway and the ruined gates, there they saw, close beside them, a great rubble heap. And suddenly, they were aware of two small figures lying on it at their ease, grey-clad, hardly to be seen among the stones. There were bottles and bowls and platters. Um, yeah, there were bottles and bowls and platters laid beside them, as if they'd just eaten well and now rested from their labour. One seemed asleep, the other with crossed legs and arms behind his head, leaned against a broken rock and sent from his mouth long wisps and little rings of thin blue smoke. For a moment, Theoden and Aymer and all his men stared at them in wonder 
Amid all the wreck of Isengard, this seemed to them the strangest sight. But before the king could speak, the small, smoke-breathing figure became suddenly aware of them as they sat there, silent, on the edge of the mist. He sprang to his feet. A young man he looked, or like one, though not much more than half a man in height. His head of brown curling hair was uncovered, but he was clad in a... <coughs> in a travel-stained cloak of the same hue and shape as the companions of Gandalf had worn when they rode to Edoras. He bowed very low, putting his hand upon his breast, and then, seeming not to observe the wizard and his friends, he turned to Eomer and the king. Welcome, my lords, to Isengard, he said. We are the Door Wardens. Meriadoc, son of Saradoc, is my name, and my companion, who, alas, is overcome with weariness, here he gave another dig with his foot, is Peregrine, son of Paladin, of the house of Took. Far in the north is our home. The Lord Saruman is within, but at the moment he is closeted with one worm tongue, or doubtless he would be here to welcome such honoured guests. <laughs> doubtless he would, laughed Gandalf. And was it Saruman that ordered you to guard his damaged doors and watch for the arrival of guests when your attention could be spared from plate and bottle? Oh, no, good sir, the matter escaped him, answered Mary gravely. He has been much occupied. There's a wonderful, playful irony about the utter defeat of Saruman. <laughs> He's been much occupied. Our orders came from Treebeard, who has taken over the management of Isengard. He commanded me to welcome the Lord of Rohan with fitting words. I've done my best. And what about your companions? What about Legolas and me? cried Gimli, unable to contain himself. You, you rascals, you, you woolly-footed, wool-pated truants, a fine hunt you've led us. Two hundred leagues through fern and forest and battle and death to rescue you. And here we find you feasting and idling and smoking, smoking. Where did you come by the weed, you villains? Hammer and tongs, I'm so torn between rage and joy that if I do not burst, it will be a marvel. <laughs> you speak for me, Gimli, said Legolas, though I would sooner learn how they came by the wine. One thing if you, are not, you have not found in your hun hunting, and that's brighter wit, said Pippin, opening an eye. Here you find us sitting on a field of victory amidst the plunder of armies, and you wonder how we come by a few well-earned comforts. Well earned, said Gimli. I cannot believe that. The riders laughed. It cannot be doubted that we witnessed the meeting of dear friends, said Theoden. So these are the lost ones of your company, Gandalf. The days are fated to be filled with marvels. Already I have seen many since I left my house. But now here, before my eyes, stand yet another of the folk of legend. Are not these the halflings that some among us call Holbitlan? Hobbits, if you please, Lord, said Pippin. Hobbits, said Theoden. Your tongue is strangely changed, but the name sounds not unfitting, so hobbits. No report that I have heard does justice to the truth. Merry bowed, and Pippin got up and bowed. You are gracious, Lord, or I hope that I may so take your words, he said. And here is another marvel. I have wandered in many lands, Silite, since I left my home, and never till now have I found people that knew any story concerning hobbits. My people came out of the north long ago, said Theoden, and I will not deceive you, we know no tales about hobbits. All that is said among us is that far away, over many hills and rivers, live the halfling folk that dwell in holes, in sand dunes. But there are no legends of their deeds, for it is said that they do little and avoid the sight of men, being able to vanish in a twinkling, and they can change their voices to resemble the piping of birds. But it seems that more could be said. Oh, it could indeed, said Mary, my lord, said Mary. For one thing, said Theoden, I had not learned that they spouted smoke from their mouths. It's not surprising, answered Mary, for it is an art. Um, it is an art which we have practised no more than for no more than a few generations. It was Tubbold Hornblower of Longbottom in the South Farthing, who first gave the true pipe weed in his gardens about the year 1070, according to our reckoning. How old Toby came by the plans? Oh, you do not know your danger, Theoden, interrupted Gandalf. These hobbits will sit on the edge of ruin 
and discuss the pleasures of the table or the small doings of their fathers, grandfathers and great-grandfathers and remoter cousins to the ninth degree if you encourage them with undue patience. Some other time would be more fitting for the history of smoking. Where is Treebeard, Mary? I love them. <laughs> this is just brilliant. That these... You do not know your danger. These hobbits will sit on the edge of ruin and discuss the pleasures of the table or the small things of their grandsires. That seems to me to be an entirely sane thing to do when you're sitting on the edge of ruin, is not to capitulate it to it, to it but to carry on indomitably uh, with the small pleasures and the doings of your family. Um, I, there's some sense in which we're all sitting on the edge of ruin. I mean, we see the ruin more palpably in the war that's raging in in uh, uh, Ukraine, but possible chaos coming to Russia. We don't know what chaos is coming to our own societies. We too may find ourselves sitting on the edge of ruin, but I think there's a kind of wisdom here that we should still consider the small good things, which after all is what one's trying to defend from ruin. No point to abandon them if you're only on the edge of it. Anyway, that's a favourite passage of mine. Thanks for dropping around and listening. See you next time.